Good morning all. As we may know that Pastor Wayne is uh, preaching elsewhere and being a blessing to another congregation this morning. So, if you want a title for this one, it's called Ripples. I was listening to a talk by an engineer uh, a week or two ago and uh, he reminded us of the scientific law that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, Newton's third law of motion, if you're making notes, but uh, that was in the context of designing rocket motors <coughs> and the thrust of a jet engine. But he started a train of thought on what the spiritual equivalent might be, because my mind goes off like this. <clears throat> if you fly a rocket or a plane through the atmosphere faster than the speed of sound, what do you get? You get a sonic boom, which is shock waves in the air. More mundane, if you drop a stone in a pond, what happens? You get ripples, which are shock waves rippling through the water from the source. There's something called chaos theory. It's not my workplace, that's another but uh, <laughs> which it says that the knock-on effects of a butterfly fluttering its wings in one place on Earth can have major weather effects in another place on Earth, thousands of miles away. Those tiny air movements by the butterfly can be ampli amplified to a series of random events to create a mighty storm. That's chaos theory. On the NASA website, on the principles of chaos, they say a more rigorous way to express the butterfly effect is that small changes in the initial conditions lead to a drastic change in the result. Now, that technical explanation I can relate better to. If chaos theory were true, and who knows that by definition theory is unproven, that's why it's theory and not fact. But now think <clears throat> and switch your thinking over to the equivalent things in the spiritual realm. What are the butterfly wings in the spiritual realm? It's everything we do and everything we say. Every word spoken, every action, not our thoughts because a thought not spoken dies. That's not specifically, you won't find those words directly in scripture, but we'll come back onto that in a minute. If you have a negative thought at any time, and we all do. We can worry where it came from. How did it get into our mind? Or was it there all the time but hidden? We know that thought and thoughts can come from the world, the flesh and the devil. But today I'm not focusing on that, where the source of the thought is coming from, because that's another message. Today I'm focusing on what we do with the thought that counts, wherever it comes from. When we become aware of a negative or ungodly thought, something that's not wholesome and good, Scripture tells us to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's in 2 Corinthians 10. And this is obviously an action that a Christian is to take. But we do need to take it. Although we're saved, and praise God, everybody in this room, as far as I'm aware, is saved, we still have a choice every day to talk, to walk either in the spirit or in the flesh. So although we're saved, we still have to walk as saved people. Whether we do it as a God-focused intent or whether we go our own way. But have you noticed that just because we're born-again Christians, 
Our lives are not lived perfectly. Unlike Jesus Christ's life on earth, his was perfect. Jesus lived in perfect obedience to his Father. He lived the life perfectly through the very real trials and tribulations, opposition, accusation, attack, and eventually the death on the cross. It's the miracle of God that what the devil thought to be his greatest victory in organising evil men to kill Jesus turned out to be his greatest failure, his greatest loss, and his greatest mistake. <coughs> Jesus had choices. He was tempted as soon as his ministry began. As soon as Jesus had been anointed by God at age 30 or so, for ministry, the devil turns up and says, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Just because you can. In Matthew 4, uh, verse 3. And then a couple of verses later, he says, jump off the top of the temple roof. The angels will look after you. Just because you can. Jesus could have chosen to do either of those things. But he knew it was not the Father's desire for him to do it. Jesus lived a victorious life because he lived in obedience to his Father and all that he said and he did. So for Jesus, so also for us. We have to make choices. All day and every day, we have choices to make. When we're aware of a negative thought in our mind, we are to take it captive. Meaning that we don't speak the negative words or make negative decisions or take a negative action. And that's what I meant earlier by I thought every thought not spoken dies. If you don't take an action physically or don't speak something out of a negative thought, you've squashed it. So there's a spiritual principle, although those words aren't in scripture. But we do need to take it captive, as it says in Corinthians. Why? Because everything we say and everything we do produces a spiritual ripple. A ripple in the spirit. It might only be a small ripple that reaches a person we're talking to. It reaches... Um, a little bit wider a field or it might be someone who we're not noticing but who are looking at what action we are taking in a situation but it can be a ripple that affects our family our church family our work colleagues parts of our community we're sending out ripples all the time if we've got a significant position you know, in the world or a higher public profile so to speak, then the ripples are likely to be bigger and go further, reaching more people, impacting more people. So whilst the chaos theory is just a theory, and whilst I may not agree with the literal butterfly effect, because it stretches my imagination too far, none of us can disagree that when you drop a stone in a pond of normal water, ripples will happen. Hopefully that at least is beyond dispute. I also like the NASA one, that small changes in the initial conditions lead to drastic changes in results. I can relate to that. I mean, we've all, all heard of uh, ships and planes that got lost because of a small error in their compass setting over a long distance, set them hundreds of miles off course. So we also need to check our spiritual compass to check that it's set true. But I'm not following that line of thought today because that's another message for another time. <clears throat> now, if we thought about this idea of spiritual ripples, and if we agree that we are producing spiritual ripples in our daily lives, wouldn't we want those ripples to be positive rather than negative? spiritual ripples that strengthen, not weaken, that build up and don't tear down. Ripples of the positive kingdom of God, of love and light 
and life and not the negative kingdom of darkness and eternal spiritual death because the power is in our tongue to some degree as scripture says <clears throat> when I was a young lad I think about 8 years old but my memories get a bit hazy my dad would sometimes take me and his model boat down to the seafront and there there was a large ornamental pond or a small lake or a lagoon whatever it's a couple of hundred yards across so whether that ticks your box for a pond or a lagoon or a, or a, a lake it's up to you but that's how much a body of water 200 meters around with this boat it's about two foot long it had a little engine I can still picture in my mind the ripples the boat produced as it motored across the water. Some days the water was calm, so we could see that very clearly the ripples the boat was making. They went across this whole body of water. Two foot boat, 200 yard pond. Other days when the wind was whipping up the surface of the water, it stirred up ripples in the water and waves the wind producing that on the surface of the water before anything else was there and on those windy days it made for a choppy crossing for the model boat but the model boat still produced its own ripples which cut through the ripples of the wind it cut through them got this massive wind coming at various strengths and one little boat cut through the ripples that were there. Hopefully you can try and sort of picture that. A model boat motoring gently across a large pond on a calm day producing ripples. It's a, an easy thing to picture. Those ripples would be noticeable to anybody that was looking at the pond. Probably more noticeable than the boat itself. Now again, if you can switch your thinking and consider that the pond is your local community or your family or your workplace and you and me are the model boat. And that the ripples we're, we're talking about are spiritual ripples that we make in our everyday choices and decisions. What I'm saying is what you say and what I say <coughs> does make a difference. We may not have realised it. or may not have realised the fullness of the difference we make. Now consider that the, the pond is a public pond where people come and others come and enjoy the views of the pond They might be just walking around, looking at the view. Others may have their model boats and be on the water or splashing around in other ways, or making ripples of their own. The ripples from other people are bumping into each other. Some days a pond will be really busy, and it doesn't seem like there's any part of the surface of the pond that's quiet. There are ripples from everywhere to everywhere across the surface. The surface. So we might think that the ripples we make won't be noticed, won't make a difference. After all, what is one boat's physical ripples or one person's spiritual ripples going to do? Well, actually, God's got a few words on that. In Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, it says, so I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it. But sadly, it goes on to say, but I found none. And that's a really sad verse in Ezekiel, because Jerusalem, who he was talking about, was in a sad and a terrible, horrible state. And the Lord was saying through the prophet, that he was searching for someone who would intercede for Jerusalem and do what was necessary for her salvation. But when he looked, he found no one to do that. 
And I believe that we can use that scripture in our own context. It's, you know, every scripture is for our learning. And that was there then for that situation. And it was pre-cross. So every scripture has to be tested by the cross to see whether it is true after the cross. Or whether the finished work of the cross changes it. And so, we know that God is for us, he's good, and he wants everyone to be saved, unquestionably. But there is obviously a response that each individual has to make to receive the benefit of God's grace, love and mercy. We, we know. You know. Until we got saved, we didn't know, didn't understand it. But now we do, you know, and we praise him for that. But there are people out there that may be Christians going through tough times. There may be people that have no spiritual group discernment. We, it's not for us to judge. But we are called to pray for people, whatever condition they're in. <laughs> Pray for individuals, pray for communities. And we do that. We did it just now, we do it on our prayer meeting on Tuesday, we do it every Sunday, we do it in our private times. And we should do it, because God wants us to pray individually and corporately for others, for our communities and our nation. So whether we're doing it on our own, whether we're doing it collectively, God wants us to do it. How do I know God wants us to do it? That it? How do I know it's his will for us? There's another scripture that uh, has been on my heart for 20 years or more. Um, and it's 2 Chronicles 7, 14, which is, might be all quite familiar. And many of them are. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. What an awesome promise. Not might or should or can, I will. So, it's not a long preach. The question I've got, do you, do I, believe that there are spiritual ripples? And can we reflect whether the spiritual ripples that you or I make are positive or negative? Might be a bit of some, you know, that's, that's life. As people of God, we are the carriers of the anointing of God. But we do need to apply that anointing to work with the Holy Spirit as he directs. Because it's not our good works that count, but good works done at the direction of God that carry the effect to make a difference. And ask ourselves and ask God to show, show us how to make all our spiritual ripples positive and to avoid the temptation of turning stones into bread. To make our ripples increasingly fruitful for the kingdom of God. Our prayers do affect our community for good. And I'm closing with a simple uh, paraphrase. Let us not get tired of doing good. Amen.